Today is a rather uh, special uh, Secrets of Things episode because these are four objects that I'll soon be parting with. And so it's, it's part of a mini-series I might be doing more of called Farewell to Things. And what they are is a shape of Chinese ceramic called a tsung. And these have a very ancient history. They go back to ancient burials to jades that had a square body and a kind of a tubular, uh, top and bottom was tubular, and they were thought to be a kind of a yin and yang corporate, uh, combination. Uh, that it was uh, heaven and earth, square and circular, male and female. I'm not sure whether the round was female and the square was heaven and male or vice versa, but in any case, it had this ritual symbolism. In later years, it got into ceramics, and these were favored ceramics of the literati, the scholars, because it had that antique resonance. And the original jades had uh, uh, s lines carved into the, si the square sides, and those in ceramics then developed in this form. And then in later years, they, they start, it, it became Yijing trigrams, Yijing hexagrams probably because those lines in the original jades were sort of dotted and straight, and so here you have dotted and straight, which conveniently had a, had a kind of Yijing feel to it. And of course the Yijing itself dates from the era when the first song were made. Now because the originals were jade, the ceramic ones tend to be either green or blue, and usually green, and it's because the green reminds us of jade, and it was usually celadon, although not always. So here we have two celadons, but a pale white one with a touch of green and a kind of uh, a crackly glaze, and here a blue one. Now Chinese ceramics uh, often come with a rain date, that is the era of the emperor uh, in whose reign they were made, on the foot, and two of these have that, this one and this one. And they tell us that this one is Kangxi and this one is Qianlong, which makes them early or later 18th century. Well, here's where a specialist and a curator will really have to get to work on these. I'm not sure if they really are 18th century or were perhaps made later in the 19th century. That is to say, a different era. But it doesn't matter because they're all a bygone era, a really a lost era, and the literati valued these pieces and created their world. And the reason why they were convenient for the literati was because they're tall and narrow, and so you can put things in them that will stand up nice and straight, such as uh, whisks and uh, rui scepters, fans, uh, brushes, and all these other objects of the literati world. So today I'm saying farewell and uh, sharing a goodbye with everyone. I've made a literati arrangement from the Tsong jars. And the reason for that is that typically, you know, you go to a museum and you see these gorgeous pieces behind glass and you appreciate and admire them, but they were never to be seen that way. They didn't stand alone. Uh, all of these Chinese classical artworks of this type belong to a world, and it's a world of study of the past appreciation of antique beauty, and also a love of nature. And that was the world that they called the world of the literati. The literati, as, as we understand it in English, usually means people that write books, or poetry, or something like that. And of course, uh, they did write books, and they did write poetry, but they also did paintings, uh, did calligraphy, admired uh, natural objects, created flower arrangements, had fascinating and witty conversations. All of that was part of the literati world. And so they would uh, typically take objects such as these, what I've done with these four tsung, and arrange them with the other objects of the scholar's studio. Literati really just means scholar. And so you would have books, classical books. This, this is a, a book of rubbings here. You would have brushes 
which are the brushes uh, you know used by a painter or a calligrapher a fan here with the uh, with the heart sutra uh, written on it uh, you'd also have rui scepters uh, which i talked about in another session hosu whisks these whisks tell us something uh, in the old days uh, they were the fly whisks that the uh, wise men in the bamboo grove used to brush away the flies of care and it came to mean what they called pure conversation that if one of these whisks is here you don't talk about politics and money and all, things like that you talk about philosophy uh, beauty art uh, things of a higher realm and so by putting a hosu whisk inside the tsung jar you have said something about the environment that, you, that you're creating. One of the aspects of these so-called literati arrangements is that they're temporary. They come and go by the season, by the guest one, by whatever use you're going to put it to. And they're artworks. Uh, in Japan, we have our ikebana, which is very particular to a particular bowl on a particular spot. But the Chinese literati arrangements include much more than just some flowers in a bowl. In fact, we've got a bit of a flower arrangement here, which are the flowers of the season at this moment, when the lotuses are beginning to wilt, the rushes are beginning to curve, and these are the very last pumpkin leaves of the season uh, before the cold really sets in. So it's seasonal, and it will change. And likewise, everything here would be moved around and changed again. Uh, so it's not, again, like a permanent museum display of some type. It's, it's the scholar's mood and creation, and he's uh, putting the objects of scholarly interest together to make, to make a whole. You would have scroll, hand scrolls, all kinds of uh, different objects could be used. So we're going to open up this scroll, which is a imperial rescript of the Qian Long Emperor, and it's very much a lost world. It, this is Manchu, not Chinese, because the emperors of China were, of course, Manchu. And Manchurian is a very elegant and beautiful script, and now uh, really basically a, a, a largely a dead language. Uh, people do still speak Manchu, but they don't write it much. Uh, and on this, so here's the seal of the emperor. And here's the same seal again in Chinese. And it's dated the 35th year of the Emperor Chen, the 36th year of the Emperor Chenlong, which is, would be 1771. Now, this would seem only tangentially to do with uh, Tsung jars, but the Tsung jars conjure, conjure a lost world. And likewise, we're looking here at a lost world. If you like what you've seen, please press like and please subscribe to Secrets of Things.